fight force was so powerful that animals about the size of a human would have literally exploded under the force, all of the bones shattering catastrophically under the bite. And despite Minmi's small size, its dense covering of armor means that if it sat down, it would have probably been almost invulnerable to any attempt at predation. I'm James Napoli. I'm a vertebrate paleontologist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And today we're going to be looking at Jurassic World Evolution 2. So let's get into it. Therizinosaurus is a theropod dinosaur, so it's a member of the same group of dinosaurs that includes T. rex and Velociraptor, uh, meat-eating dinosaurs mostly. But Therizinosaurus is a plant eater. It's the namesake of a group of animals that we call Therizinosaurus. They remain really poorly understood. We don't have a lot of them in the fossil record. We've never found a full skeleton of Therizinosaurus itself. So a lot of its reconstruction in this game is based on close relatives and artistic interpretation by the people at Universal Studios and the people who made this game. So one thing we do know about Therizinosaurus though, is that it had very, very long straight claws on its hand, which we've depicted accurately here. With the keratin sheath, the nail that goes over the bony claw, these claws all would have been over three feet long, so over a meter long. The arms of the Therizinosaurus are actually depicted correctly. A lot of depictions of dinosaurs in movies and video games show the palms of the dinosaurs kind of curled inward. But we know from the way that the bones actually go together that dinosaur hands couldn't do that. Theropod dinosaur hands always faced each other, with the palms facing just like they're about to clap. And what's really cool is that while they were making this movie and this video game, they started to depict many of the dinosaurs with the correct orientation of the arms. And so here we see Therizinosaurus eating. So it's correctly depicting in the video game that this animal was a plant eater. All Therizinosaurus were. What I'd say are inaccuracies in this portrayal are that Therizinosaurus was probably not feeding from the ground. It's got a very, very long neck and long arms with long claws on them. I think it's much more likely that it was kind of acting like a dinosaur version of a giraffe eating food from high up in the trees that most other herbivores couldn't reach. We don't really know what they use their claws for. We think probably a combination of helping it feed, maybe slashing down branches that it could eat, and probably self-defense. This is a very large herbivorous dinosaur. It's larger than T-Rex. So it would have been a very, very good target for a lot of large predators that wanted a good meal. When an animal like this was targeted, it probably fought back with the large claws on its hand, which is something that we actually see it do in the game and in the movie Jurassic World Dominion. So one great detail about Therizinosaurus, as it's depicted here, is that it's covered in feathers. We know from some exceptional fossil evidence that not only were very bird-like dinosaurs like Velociraptor covered in feathers, but that most groups of dinosaurs seem to have had feathers when they originated. These feathers would have been very simple, like the feathers of a modern emu, which is depicted in the feathers on Therizinosaurus here. Birds are a group of living dinosaurs. They're dinosaurs just in the same way that T-Rex and Velociraptor and Triceratops are. And so what's really good to see is that bird-like design and behavioral cues are being shown in animals that are their closer relatives, right? It helps underscore the fact that birds are not different from dinosaurs in any major way. They're just the group of dinosaurs that survived the asteroid at the end of the Cretaceous period. Therizinosaurus and its relatives are so poorly known that we don't really know if they were social, but one species of early Therizinosaur called Falcarius was discovered in a bone bed with many individuals. We're still excavating that bone bed. We don't know how many individuals are there, but it certainly seems to have been very many. So this animal is Giganotosaurus. This was the villain dinosaur for Jurassic World Dominion, the movie that this video game is mostly based on. It's again, not tremendously well known. It's not very well studied right now, but it's one of the largest theropod dinosaurs that ever existed. It was both longer and a little bit taller than T-Rex, although T-Rex was much more heavily built and would have weighed a lot more than Giganotosaurus. Giganotosaurus is a member of a group of dinosaurs called Allosaurs. This is a subgroup of theropod dinosaurs that's uh, most typically exemplified by the very common dinosaur Allosaurus. During the Cretaceous period, allosaurs became pretty dominant in the southern continents, so in South America and Africa, where they radiated into an exceptional diversity of species, rivaling tyrannosaurs that mostly lived in North America and Asia. We see that Therizinosaur is mostly using the claws on its hand as a weapon. Giganotosaurus is biting. Its arms were not as small as T-Rex's, but were a lot longer and probably more useful. But that said, its head was still definitely its primary weapon. The Therizinosaur is defending itself pretty well, Often in dinosaur media, we see herbivores as being pushovers that always get killed by predators. It's nice to see an herbivorous dinosaur finally fighting back and doing serious damage to the animal trying to harm it. So this little guy is Dimetrodon. So Dimetrodon is often one of these animals that's included in children's books on dinosaurs, but it's not a dinosaur at all. Dimetrodon is actually one of our earliest relatives. So it's a member of a group of animals called synapsids. 
Synapsida is a group that includes mammals, but also includes these very reptilian looking animals that were their earliest members. Uh, they're characterized by having one hole in the skull behind the eye socket that allowed jaw muscle to pass through. So Dimetrodon being a mammal relative, it starts to show some very interesting innovations of mammals that happened during our evolution, right? We see changes to their lower jaw that indicate the beginning of the development of a mammalian jaw and ear system. We start to see division of the teeth into different functional units. Reptiles tend to have very uniform teeth. Dimetrodon has multiple segments of its jaw with teeth that are specialized for different functions during feeding. That's something we have. We have incisors for biting food. We have canines for piercing. We have molars for grinding and crushing and chewing. Dimetrodon's most notable feature, though, is definitely the sail on its back. There's a lot of argument today among paleontologists as to what the function of the sail really was. Some people think it was for display. Some people think that it was for increasing the animal's surface area and allowing it to heat up and cool down more effectively. There was even one proposal that it had sails attached to it that it used to swim by like floating across rivers and lakes like a sailboat. One final thing about Dimetrodon's appearance in this game is that it's shown with very crocodilian looking scoots all over its body. It seems that the character designers for these movies really liked adding crocodile scales. But Dimetrodon probably not only didn't have crocodile scales, I would bet that it didn't have scales at all. Modern reptile scales are something that's only seen in that lineage. They're a very special anatomical structure with different types of tissue that mammals never developed and never displayed. Dimetrodon has an interesting shape of its upper jaw where the uh, front of the jaw is kind of kinked to receive an enlargement of the lower jaw. That's a pretty common thing we see in animals that eat fish. And so there is an idea that Dimetrodon was primarily evolved as a fish eater. And indeed, we do usually find it in lake and river sediments that indicate that it was probably favoring an aquatic environment. One other very interesting thing about Dimetrodon is that it did live prior to the age of dinosaurs. So it's often depicted as being something that lived with the dinosaurs, and it's often called the dinosaur. But not only was it not a dinosaur, but it went extinct long before the first dinosaur ever evolved. It lived in a time in Earth's history called the Permian, at the end of which was the worst mass extinction that's ever occurred. The extinction that killed the dinosaurs was incredibly devastating, uh, causing about 70% of species to go extinct. But at the end of the Permian, over 90% of all animals alive went extinct. It was the very closest life has come to being completely annihilated on planet Earth, and Dimetrodon was unfortunately one of the casualties of that extinction event. I don't know if we know anything about Dimetrodon's social behavior, but it is fun to see the animals interact with each other. I could totally have seen them being a little bit social, or at the very least, living in close proximity to each other the way a lot of modern species of crocodilians do. All of them basking on the riverbank, occasionally entering the water when they wanted to hunt. So it does look like the Dimetrodon are moving their sails a little bit, with the kind of bony supports of the sail moving closer or farther together to change its shape. That wouldn't have been possible. So the bony supports of that sail are actually just long extensions of the animal's spinal column. So those bones are locked in position. There's no joint that they could have used to change the position of those support structures. I love the way it's running is animated here. It looks very, very much like a large lizard chasing down prey on land. I think it does a great job of showing how these very primitive animals would have really run when they were moving. They were living on land. They were not that far removed from their ancestors that lived in the water, and they weren't yet very specialized for terrestrial locomotion. So they're running on land, they're not doing a great job of it, they don't have adaptations for it yet, and so they move a lot like the modern animals that don't have those kinds of adaptations, such as large lizards like a Komodo dragon. Quetzalcoatlus. This is the largest flying animal that we've ever discovered in the fossil world. Its wingspan was about 40 feet long, so we're talking about an animal the size of a World War II fighter plane. Its skull alone was probably about 10 feet or 3 meters long. This is a massive, massive animal. We think that Quetzalcoatlus actually had a very different style of life than other pterosaurs, this group of flying reptiles that were close relatives of dinosaurs, but not true members of the group Dinosauria. We think that pterosaurs like Quetzalcoatlus spent a lot of their time on the ground. They probably would have been able to move very quickly, and we think that they hunted ground-dwelling animals like small dinosaurs picking them up like giant storks do today in the African savanna. So one very cool detail about the portrayal of pterosaurs like Quetzalcoatlus in this game is that they're covered in a dense layer of feathers. So the discovery of feathers in the fossil record is a very good indication that the animal that possessed them was warm-blooded and was therefore much more similar to modern birds and mammals than they were to other reptiles. This is one of the major pieces of evidence that we've used to infer that all dinosaurs were warm-blooded, at least when the groups originated and that they weren't cold-blooded like we assumed for a very long time. 
You can see that the pterosaur wing is constructed of an extremely elongated finger bone. So if we trace the joints of the, of the arms here, starting at the body, we have the shoulder, the elbow joint points backward, the wrist joint points forward, and then we have the metacarpal bones extending down to the ground. On the ground are three very small and weakly developed fingers that they probably only used for walking on, on the ground. And then there's a very, very, very long fourth finger that points backward and becomes the end of the wing. This is how pterosaurs built their wings. In fact, one pterosaur, an animal called pterodactylus, which is why we call the group pterodactyls informally a lot of the time, literally means wing finger. It was the first one ever discovered, and it baffled early comparative anatomists who were trying to understand whether it was a bird or a bat, before they realized that it was a member of an entirely new group of flying reptiles. This wing design is really, really weird when you think about it, especially given how large the fourth finger is in relation to the other three. But it seems to be one of the best wing designs there is because pterosaurs get larger than every other group of flying animal. No bird has ever approached the size of a fighter plane, but pterosaurs did it a lot. Quetzalcoatlus isn't the only one that got that big. We don't have very good remains of all the other members of its close family, but all of them seem to be these very large flying animals that would have terrorized both the land and the skies at the end of the age of dinosaurs. There's very good reason to believe that it was mostly living on land, not near waterways, and that its primary prey were small dinosaurs, especially the babies of large dinosaurs like T. rex and Triceratops that lived with it in the late Cretaceous of North America. Now here we get a view of one of the most exciting animals from the movie Jurassic World Dominion and this game. So Pyroraptor is a dromaeosaurid dinosaur. These are the raptor dinosaurs like Velociraptor. They're the primary group of dinosaurs that I study for my research. And so I was really excited to see one being portrayed with feathers in the game and movie. So Pyroraptor itself is very poorly known. The only known specimen of it comes from the south of France, lived in the Cretaceous period. And the fossil that we have is very scrappy. It's only a few bones from the foot. One of the best details about it is that it is completely covered in feathers. We specifically know that Velociraptor had huge quill feathers on its arms that would have formed these kinds of wings that Pyroraptor shown with here. We actually have bumps preserved on the bones of Velociraptor that show that those feathers were attaching. There's an argument to be made that these animals are so bird-like that if they were alive today, we would probably consider them birds rather than reptiles. And I think that that's pretty accurate. Almost all anatomical traits that we see in birds are also seen in dromaeosaurid dinosaurs. They are incredibly bird-like skeletally. One thing that is really interesting is that dromaeosaurid dinosaurs like Velociraptor and Pyroraptor would not really have been able to fly. It's possible that some early members of the group did have the potential for flight, but these animals retained their big wings despite being entirely flightless. And we think that it's very possible that they used them while they were hunting. It's possible that they were jumping onto large prey items and using these feathers to maintain stability while they held on and tried to kill their prey. It's possible that they were very acrobatic and liked to jump around from trees and rock formations and that they were using their feathers as a way to stabilize and parachute to the ground and avoid injury. One inaccurate detail in Pyroraptor is that the teeth in the upper jaw continue far too far back. So it's a common trait of dinosaurs that the tooth row actually ends well anterior or forward of the eye socket. Um, none of the skull bones of Pyroraptor are known, so we have no idea what his head looked like. In fact, we have no idea what most of the animal looked like. It does seem like good character design to take the amount of freedom imparted by an incomplete fossil record and using it to develop a very, very interesting and distinctive character design. Something that's very memorable for an audience who might only see the animal briefly and never really know its name. So you can see while the animal's running, it's kicking its arms out to the side a little bit. Modern ground-dwelling birds tend to use their arms while they run as control surfaces. So they actually are more maneuverable because they can use their wings to control airflow around their body and help them make tighter turns. It's very cool to see the animal using its arms in that way because it's depicted with wings here. You can see that as the animal jumps, it tends to flap its wings a little bit, probably to cancel motion if it thinks it's going to overshoot the target. It's just really, really cool to see the presence of wings fully integrated into the animal's behavior. Here we see another dinosaur preening, right? So preening is a behavior that birds do to keep their feathers clean and healthy, free of parasites. It's something that all of these feathered dinosaurs would have had to do pretty frequently, and it's cool to see it depicted as a resting behavior here. It's something that's easy to miss and not think about, but dinosaurs were not just constantly running around fighting, biting, roaring, screaming, and trying to kill each other. They were real animals, and they had to do things real animals do. And one of the most important of those is keeping your body clean and healthy. So, dromaeosaurid dinosaurs are often depicted as pack animals in media. That's mostly because of Jurassic Park, but it's actually something we have some evidence for. So, the animal Deinonychus, which is a larger relative of Velociraptor from North America, 
has been found repeatedly in these multi-individual associations where there's one prey animal and a number of different individuals of dynamics. The fact that an animal is social doesn't mean it's always going to be friendly with the other individual of its species. Humans are social and we kill each other all the time. So here we have two dromaeosaurs fighting each other. We have an unfeathered velociraptor, which is depicted inaccurately because it's a Jurassic Park franchise thing, fighting with and losing to a pyroraptor, which is feathered. It's always nice to see the superiority of feathered, accurate dinosaurs in media over outdated, scaly dinosaurs. Giganotosaurus is one of the largest theropod dinosaurs we've ever discovered. It was both longer and taller than T. rex itself, but it was very likely not heavier. T. rex is a much more heavily built animal. What's interesting here is that two of them appear to have been bred and hatched at the same time for this game. And Giganotosaurus comes from a group of dinosaurs for which some social behavior is apparently attested by the fossil record. Giganotosaurus itself is not known to have been social, but a very close relative of it called Mapusaurus was discovered in a bone bed with many different individuals of different size and age. So this appears to have been a family group of the animals that was all killed at once. So that's a really cool little animation showing what appears to be a ritualized sort of social ritual. Many animals tend to do this where they'll have synchronized behavior. It's something that they seem to do to form pair bonds, and it's something that dinosaurs surely would have done as well. We have no way of knowing exactly what they would have done, uh, but it is a very bird-like thing that was probably common in, in dinosaurs, and especially in theropod dinosaurs like Giganotosaurus that are, that are members of the broader group that contains them on this encounter could never have really occurred because Giganotosaurus and T. rex did not live in the same place or at the same time. Giganotosaurus also lived in the Cretaceous period but lived earlier in the Cretaceous period than T. rex. T. rex lived in North America and has never been recovered in South America. Giganotosaurus lived in South America and has never been recovered in North America. Giganotosaurus was a little bit taller and a little bit longer but T. rex was much heavier and a much more powerful animal. Bite force was the strongest of any terrestrial animal we've ever discovered. T. rex's bite was designed to crush bone, and we know from fossilized T. rex poop that it did crush bone all the time. If T. rex gets a single bite in on Giganotosaurus, I think that's probably the end. It would bite right through the bones, right through the vertebrae or the leg, and instantly immobilizing or incapacitating its opponent before killing it. T. rex is an extremely powerful animal. I'm surprised that the Jurassic Park franchise has never really explored how powerful T. rex's bite was, because I think it's something that would play very well on the big screen. Imagine the fight between two dinosaurs ending so suddenly as soon as T. rex gets its jaws around the victim for the very first time. One other detail about the T. rex here that's worth noting is that this is a feathered T. rex. We don't have much direct evidence of T. rex skin. But we do know that T. rex's relatives were at times fully feathered animals, even when they approached very large body sizes. There's a lot of debate right now among paleontologists. There are patches of T. rex's skin that we know were scaly, but all birds have scales and feathers somewhere on their body. And so knowing that T. rex had some very small areas of scales absolutely doesn't preclude the idea that it was mostly feathered. So Werosaurus is a Chinese relative of Stegosaurus. It's mostly known for having these kind of low blunted plates all along its back. So stegosaurs in general were very common throughout the age of dinosaurs. They are one of the earliest groups of dinosaurs that sh start showing very, very prominent defensive adaptations. These being the spikes at the end of their tails. This arrangement of spikes at the end of the tail is what we call a thagomizer. It's actually named for a cartoon from the comic strip The Far Side by Gary Larson. Thagomizers were this arrangement of straight outward pointing spikes at the end of the tail there's no way for them to have been anything other than defensive weapons. If they were using them when they were fighting each other for dominance or for mates, they would have easily killed one another. And we know that they were able to deliver them with a lot of force because we found a fossil of an Allosaurus that has a giant hole in its pelvis that only matches the shape of a Stegosaurus tail spike. And so this starts a very, very storied trend in dinosaur evolution of plant-eating dinosaurs developing large defensive equipment whether they be spikes at the end of the tail, spikes on the front of the face, or a body-wide covering of dense armor. So that exact sort of motion where the stegosaurus swings its tail sideways, the spikes leveled and hitting the midsection of the allosaurus, is exactly what we have evidenced in the fossil record. It's really, really cool to see that displayed in the game. I do love the kind of naturalistic depiction of the werehosaurus in this game. Character designs in this game are very variable in their approach, but I do like that this animal was really designed to simply just be a larger before. It doesn't have a lot of details that make it look overly scary or overly monsterified. It seems to be something that's very reminiscent of how the real animal would have looked. And I think that's cool to see as a paleontologist. 
So here we see two individuals of Werhosaurus that have slightly different colors. So the one on the left is much more uh, vibrant. It's a bright green with yellow stripes. The one on the right is brown with dark brown stripes, more muted. Now, in this game, I know that you're able to customize the colors of the animals using genetic manipulation, but the way that it's been done in this clip makes it look a lot like something called sexual dimorphism. So sexual dimorphism is simply when the males and females of an animal species look different from one another. In the background here, we see an ankylosaur fighting a werehosaurus. These are actually members of the same broader group of dinosaurs. We call them Thyreophora, or the shield bearers. One group of them, the stegosaurs, went extinct at the end of the Jurassic period, where the other group became predominant of the Cretaceous. The other group are ankylosaurs, which are characterized by having very, very dense coverings of bony armor including armor plates that were embedded in their eyelids, rather than vertical plates like a stegosaur. Stegosaurs tended to have spikes on the end of the tail, and chylosaurs tended to have bony clubs. One thing that the game isn't showing that might only be known right now for stegosaurus itself is that some stegosaurs had what we call gular armor, these armor plates all embedded on the bottom of the throat. We're, we're unsure what the function of these armor plates was, but it seems pretty obvious that they were defensive in nature. Stegosaurs tended to have fairly long necks, which were their one major vulnerable point, and so it makes sense that they would have evolved armor plating to make that point as well protected as the rest of their body. So this is a giant marine animal called Chronosaurus. This is not a dinosaur. It's actually a group of marine reptiles uh, that are close relatives of the long-necked plesiosaurs. But beyond that, their position in the tree of life is a little uncertain. They may be relatives of turtles, they may be relatives of lizards and snakes. We're not sure right now. We need better fossil evidence to tell. Chronosaurus is one of the largest marine predators that has ever existed. It had giant 10 foot long heads full of teeth that interlocked with each other as we see here. Its fossils have been found all over, but the best fossils of Chronosaurus were found in Australia and can currently be seen at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. We're not restricted to dinosaurs anymore. We've seen pterosaurs, which are close relatives of dinosaurs, and now we're seeing their more distant relatives like Chronosaurus and even mammal line animals like Dimetrodon. It's really cool to see this here. I don't know if we can really prove that Chronosaurus was able to jump out of the water with that much force. This was a really massive animal, and having it jump out of the water like a dolphin or a whale is probably something that was beyond the realm of plausibility. So here we have Chronosaurus locked in combat with another marine reptile called a Mosasaur. This mosasaur is actually a Tylosaurus, specifically. So Tylosaurus and other mosasaurs are kind of at the center of a scientific controversy right now. We don't know what kind of lizard they are. Lizards are a really, really diverse group of animals, and we don't know where in their family tree mosasaurs actually belong. So one camp of the debate says that mosasaurs are much more anatomically similar to Komodo dragons and other monitor lizards, and that they're a member of that branch of the lizard family tree. The other camp of the debate says that they have much more in common with snakes anatomically, and that they're actually members of the snake lineage, not the modern monitor lizard lineage. Unfortunately, here we're seeing the Tylosaurus being completely destroyed by the Chronosaurus. That might have happened, but I think it kind of does Tylosaurus a disservice. Tylosaurus was over 50 feet long. It was an incredibly dangerous predator that lived in the Western Interior Seaway. It was probably very, very dangerous and the top predator in its ecosystem. So here we've got a little armored dinosaur called Minmi. Uh, Minmi actually held a record for a long time as the dinosaur with the shortest scientific name. That record's now been beaten by an animal called May. It's a very small species of armored dinosaur that's known only from Australia. It's really cool to see it in this game because it's a pretty obscure dinosaur. It's not really well represented in the fossil record. It's never been in any other media to my knowledge. The only note that I'd have about its design is that the pattern of scales on its face is much more clearly inspired by that of a sea turtle than any living close relative of dinosaurs, uh, crocodilians, or birds. So you can see that despite its small size, Minmi is absolutely covered in armor plates and armor nodules. Ankylosaurs like Ankylosaurus and Minmi were very, very heavily armored creatures. As I said before, they even had an armor plate in their eyelid. These animals are clearly trying to avoid predation by being as hard to kill as they possibly can be. And despite Minmi's small size, its dense covering of armor means that if it sat down, it would have probably been almost invulnerable to any attempt at predation. So here we're seeing Minmi being hunted by a velociraptor. Unfortunately, the Minmi is trying to stand and fight back rather than hunkering down. If it did lay down on the ground with its soft belly covered by the ground and armor plates all over the rest of its body, there's no way an animal like Velociraptor would ever be able to hunt it. And I think it's a great bit of cute character design for this small little armored dinosaur. That said, it's pretty unlikely that that's actually what it looked like. 
So this is Parasaurolophus, which is one of my favorite dinosaurs and is one of my favorite dinosaur designs in this game because it's really been updated to reflect our modern understanding of what the animal looked like. This is really just stunningly accurate. There are some details that would probably change. I think Parasaurolophus probably walked on four legs when it was moving slowly, probably ran on two legs when it needed to move quickly, but for, for slow speed locomotion, it probably walked on all fours. The shape of the bill at the front of its mouth, the duck bill that gives this group of dinosaurs a name, the striping on the body that might've helped break up its outline and hide it from predators. It's all a real slam dunk of character design. I'm a really, really big fan of this. One really cool thing about Parasaurolophus is that it's the only dinosaur that we might have some idea of what it sounded like. So the interior of its big crest was hollow and connected to the nasal passage. We think that they used it as a resonating chamber when they were vocalizing. And so paleontologists have made copies of the interior of Parasaurolophus' crest, and they forced air through them to play them like a tuba. When we'd play that sound, we'd get this very, very deep trumpeting sound that Parasaurolophus probably made to communicate over long distances. That is in some ways fairly bird-like, in other ways is completely alien and unlike any animal that's alive today. It even extends to the vocalization in conveying scientific knowledge in a way that's really accessible to the gamer and it is not obtrusive to the gameplay. You're learning stuff about the dinosaur just by the process of playing, not through any sort of educational content. And I just think that that's a wonderful way to convey modern scientific knowledge about dinosaurs. T-Rex is a very, very popular dinosaur, and I think that's for great reason. T-Rex is the largest land-living meat-eating dinosaur we've ever discovered. Its bite force was more powerful than any other predator that's ever lived on land. It could crush bone easily, in fact, its bite force was so powerful that animals about the size of a human would have literally exploded under the force, all of the bones shattering catastrophically under the bite. It was fairly smart for a dinosaur with a fairly large brain. It had good eyesight, an amazing sense of smell, probably pretty good hearing. It's got it all. It's just an incredible animal. It's one of the pinnacles of evolution, and it's one of the best understood dinosaurs in the world. In fact, T-Rex is one of the best researched vertebrates that's ever lived. There's only more knowledge of the anatomy of humans and of animals like mice and rats that we do our research on. Otherwise, we know more about T-Rex than any other dinosaur that's ever lived. We know how it grew, we knew how it fed, we knew how fast it could run. There's no other dinosaur for which our body of knowledge even comes close. There's a lot of debate over whether T-Rex really had feathers. There are some patches of scaly skin that we know of for T-Rex. These patches of skin that were associated with the T-Rex skeleton but they tend to come from the underside of the animal, and they're all very, very small. T-Rex was enormous. Each of these patches of skin is only a couple of inches wide. We know more about T-Rex than we know about any other type of dinosaur. And for that reason, I love being able to work on dinosaurs like it, because we know so much about them. With T-Rex, we've got dozens of full skeletons, and we can do so much incredible science to really learn more about what they were like when they were alive. I think many paleontologists consider the hype about T-Rex to be overblown, but when it's the only dinosaur that we really know almost anything about, I don't think there's any way to overstate how important it is to our field. So one of the things that I love about Jurassic World Evolution is the diversity of dinosaurs and other prehistoric reptiles present, and different degrees of accuracy to which they're depicted. So the dinosaurs in the movies are obviously copying their movie depictions, and some of those are accurate and some of them are not. But the dinosaurs and other animals that are depicted that were not in the Jurassic Park movies are usually actually pretty anatomically accurate. So it's really great to be able to see this mix of art styles, and to see some really, really, really well done dinosaur artwork in a major video game. But the dinosaurs fully brought to life with sound and realistic motion and all of that. I just think that this is a really cool opportunity to see a huge diversity of prehistoric life all in one place. That's all for Jurassic World Evolution 2. If you want to see more Gameology, you can check out Gameology's YouTube or Facebook pages. If you want to see more of me, you can find me on Twitter at JGM Paleo or on YouTube at the new channel I've created with some colleagues called The Skeleton Crew, where we discuss all things paleontology. And we'll see you next time.